Welcome to the Firetime Podcast, where it's never hot enough, slow is fast, and the way to win is to make it so stupidly easy to buy from you that there's no excuse not to. I'm your host, Tim Reed. And once again, I'm so excited to be here today. Thank you for listening to the Firetime Podcast. Now for today's episode, I'm going to start out with a question that I want you to answer right now. Who is the best sales rep that you've ever had? Think about that for a minute. I'm sure that someone comes to mind. Maybe a couple people do. This is going to be the theme of this episode. So today we're going to be talking to, in my opinion, someone that is a top flight sales rep. And we're going to be diving into what are the practices that he brings to the table to do a good job both for his dealers and for the company that he represents. I've talked about this before in the podcast, but when I think about my quote unquote growing up in the industry, it was really sales reps that left the biggest impressions on me. I've talked before in the show about people like Kip Rumens, Ed Hozak, Deb Hannig, and and folks who really taught me how to sell and how to be a professional when I was, you know, a kid playing in a punk rock band trying to figure out life. And I'm excited for you to hear Art today because Art is somebody who I didn't know well during those formative years. I've gotten to know Art probably in the last six to seven years more intimately, but he is somebody who I have seen is an absolute professional. And He's a sales rep that I I know companies who have taken on product lines because of him as a rep outside of any value that the product does or doesn't bring to the table. And that is a testament to the value that can come from a sales rep that knows their craft and understands how to give value to their dealers. So in this conversation, I just wanted to have an honest talk with Art about, you know, what is it that you do on a daily basis? What's your focus when you're on the road? What do you do when you have an office day? And really, we're trying to answer the question, how is it that you bring value? My hope for you, if you're listening to this as a dealer, is that you think about and understand what it is a sales rep is trying to do. You know, very often, dealers can just blow sales reps off and not give them the time of day. I I talk to a lot of sales reps across the country, and one of the things that can be frustrating for them is like, look, I'm trying to coach these dealers. I'm trying to coach their team members and they don't want to listen. I could help them sell more if they would just listen to me. Now, on the other side of that, sure, there's plenty of bad reps out there that are just looking to sell a PO. They're not looking to invest in your team and it's, it's easy to spot them. But there's a lot of really, really good people that are trying to give value. So if you're a dealer listening to this, I want you to understand that perspective. Vice versa, if you're a sales rep or if you work for a distributor or a manufacturer, you need to listen to this episode because it's going to set the bar really high. And truthfully, when you listen to Art talk, these are the kinds of things that you should expect out of your rep. Your reps should go in with a plan. Your reps should be able to have live sales practice with their dealers and help them get better. They should be able to be like a business consultant for these dealers that they talk to because the truth is they see the marketplace in general. I mean, your sales reps have, I would say, a better understanding of the market at the micro level than you do, and they really need to be listened to. So I'm going to get out of the way and we're going to jump into this conversation, but as we listen to this, I want you to pay attention to how seriously Art takes the idea of giving value to the people that he serves. And then as always, we'll circle back at the end and talk about it. Joining me live from Portland, Oregon is the Pacific Northwest sales rep from Endota Hearth Products. I'm here today with Art Ratcliffe. Art, how you doing? Tim, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. And actually, this is this is a treat for me because I, I live in Portland and you're up in Washington in the Seattle area and you happen to be in town. And I said, man, let's do this in person instead of via Zoom or whatever other digital mechanism we normally use. Yeah, I'm, I'm digging it. It's, it's great to see live people. It's a good thing. Yeah. Well, hey, Art, I'm excited to jump into this interview and I really want to just think about like what's a day in the life of a successful sales rep. I think that there's a lot of people listening to this that are going to get insight from your journey, your practices, and where you've been able to find success. But I first want to talk about what's been your path to get here. Where have you been in the hearth industry so far? 
Well, I was lucky enough to be uh, family friends with the owners of Associated Energy Systems. They're a distributor up in the Pacific Northwest. And actually, it started before that. Uh, when I was a teenager, I was splitting wood and stacking wood and, de- and delivering stoves for Burien Fireplace Center. And that is uh, the, the owners of AES had, had retail stores before they had the distributorship. So uh, I, I was sweeping parking lots and stacking, stove, stacking wood uh, before before I started working for AES. Wow, so, and you're like 27 now, so that, this, this, is like, this is like your 10th year in the industry. It's amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, yeah, so I st- started out on inside sales, second job out of college uh, with, with uh, AES, and then just moved on to outside sales, and more recently now I've been a little over three years with Mendota Hearth Products. That's great. Well, I want to get into this because your name always comes up when discussions of the best sales reps are being had. And, I, and I'm not saying that's a flattery. I'm just saying that it does. When, and this is not, this is conversations with retailers, not with like other sales reps or manufacturers, but retailers that work with you or have worked with you truly believe that you are, if not the best, one of the best sales reps that they've ever had. And I know you're going to deny credit, so we're not going to go there, but I want to jump into where did you learn to be so effective as a sales rep? Well, I think I think all of us, regardless of whether we're working for a manufacturer, distributor, <clears throat> a retailer, we've got opportunities, right? We've, we're surrounded by good people and good processes, and so it's just picking up the training that we've been around. I've got to give credit to AES. You know, Kirk and Craig, the owners there, really set a tone for uh, performance and accountability, and it's it's true. It's like New York. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. <laughs> um, so, you know, when they set that atmosphere of competition and efficiency, uh, they, they sell a lot of products, right? Just like our retailers. And so you've got to have competency in a lot of areas. You've got to be able to pivot depending on the season or, or who's standing in front of you. So I think that really uh, demanded that we were organized. And I'd also say just the people that are around us, right? We all have great people around us. Yeah. Uh, I think of the legends in our industry. You've had Bill Lentz and talked about Tom Pugh on your podcast, but I think of uh, uh, Jerry Fisk, who was a longtime rep for Travis Industries in the Pacific Northwest. That guy was the hardest working rep in the industry. He ran circles around all the younger guys and really showed us, you know, by example, how to serve the retailer how to work hard for the retailer, and still how to be competitive in position products. He did a great job. Bill Wing, uh, of course, is a great hustler out there in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. I'd also say professional retailers, right, who demand the most of us. When I was first starting in this industry, I would call on Sutter Home and Hearth up in the Seattle area. And the original owners, uh, Mike Duvall and, and John Miner, made it very clear to me early on uh, I was not going to just stop by and shoot the breeze, right? I had to have an appointment. I had to have an agenda. I had to bring value. And, you know, I'm not there to stock their brochures. I love it. So, I love so, it. so that, and, and Daniel Hammer, the new owner, has carried that tradition on, and, and really it demands the best of, of me, and it, it reminds me that I better bring it when I make sales calls. Well, I love it. I mean, and just the fact that you do that sets you apart from so many other sales reps. I mean, I've I've told this story before on the podcast, but but there's there's been times in the past where even though I was managing multiple stores, I'd be on the floor at, in one of them, and a sales rep would walk in the door, see me, and be like, "Oh, do you have five minutes?" And I would honestly say, "No, I don't." And then they would instantly jump right in. Well, I've, I've got this for you, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this. And I would listen. You know, I'd try to be kind, and I would listen and say, "Oh, okay, awesome, thank you." I take their brochures. They would walk out the door. They would check the box because they were able to talk to the manager and I would walk over to the trash can, throw it in the trash and keep going with my day. And the only reason I'm thinking about it is because I'm telling the story right now on the podcast. And I think that many reps operate that way and they, and they give the best reps like you, you know, kind of a bad rap sometimes. But I think that there's such a differentiation when a rep really is bringing value like you're describing. I want to ask you about one person too before we move on. Craig Newby's had a big impact on you, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So Craig's been on this podcast before. It was actually a, an episode called uh, Sales Rep Don't Waste My Time when him and, and David Roswald were on. But can you talk about the impact that Craig has had? I know that not everyone may be familiar with him, but if, if you're in the Pacific Northwest, this guy's a legend and everyone that does business with AES has been impacted by Craig. 
Craig is the relationship arm of AES, really. So he, he is the, the front man. He, he spends time caring about AES's customer base. And so I think he'd be the first guy to say he is not a teacher. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't want to be the guy standing in front of a room giving a seminar on how to be a great salesman. But he is one of those guys like a Jerry Fisk, right? Like a Tom Pugh, Edward Hosack yeah. now following on Jerry's footsteps. But my gosh, if you just sit back and watch Craig at his craft, how to be organized, how to anticipate questions, the, the, the guy gets up and in the shower, he's rehearsing his, his sales calls he's going to have in the following day. So it's, it's, it sets a pretty high standard. That's amazing. Well, I want to jump into this now because I want to get really practical. I think this is going to be great for sales reps who are listening, who want to brush up on just the tools in their toolbox, but also for retailers just to think about, I mean, you're going to set a high standard for reps and retailers should demand a high standard. And I, and I want to jump into the, the practices that, that, that you embody, but what's the most important thing you do that's made you successful? Well, boy, I, I think the, the first thing really doesn't have much to do with sales and it's just, it's just a life uh, attitude, frankly. And, you know, I, I read that I'm expected to approach life really as a steward, right? We've been giving, we've been given gifts. Yeah. We've been given job opportunities or, you know, family or our time or whatever it is. And so I think it starts with that attitude of whatever resources I have, I'm held accountable for how I use those resources, right? And so uh, I want to make the most of what I do for my employer, I want to make the most of how I handle my time and be responsible with that and, and not waste it. So I think, you know, I think that stewardship is really the, the, the predominant attitude to, to, to keep me centered as far as what my job is. But I've got a friend of mine who gave me a hat once that says, you're owed nothing. <laughs> you must deliver value first. You, you may have heard that saying before. Yeah, I don't know who came up with that saying and who sent you that hat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, in a competitive environment, there's always someone who does things better, right? Who makes more sales, yeah. who performs a service cheaper, right? So I, like you mentioned, I decided I better differentiate myself yeah. and deliver, you know, more value in a sea of good reps, right? In comp competitive products, my hope is that I can coach business owners and salespeople for how their life is going to be better using our products, right? How they're going to make more money. Yeah. I mean, and I think that this is so cool. So w when I was in retail, we would have reps that would come in once a quarter to once a year. And basically the goal was to win a PO and you knew who those reps were. They didn't care about training. They were just pressuring you for displays and then they'd leave and you'd never see them again. And then there were reps like you. I mean, I'm not even going to say reps. There was a rep like you who would come in and, and you had the whole package where you would invest in training and coaching for our team. And I can think of multiple times where we would have a Mendota fireplace and maybe there'd be a delay on our service crew getting out to take care of a customer and a sales rep would want to go out and take care of them. And you would actually go out with them to the customer's house to teach them how to do, you know, whatever it was, whether it's replacing a screen or something on a gas valve, like you had the knowledge to do it and you put your money where your mouth is, not just with sales coaching, but with actually going out. And it goes back to your solving our problems. I mean, if you've got a team member who has a, a fireplace in the field that maybe has a small issue, there's a delay with your service team getting out there, the customer's upset, for the sales rep to come in and take the team member out there just to knock it out and get it taken care of, that's unbelievable. And that's something that sets you apart from just about any other rep I've worked with. Well, there, there's a lot of, thank you for that, but there's a lot of great reps out there. And uh, really this game that we're in is a marathon, not a sprint. It's a small industry, so we, we got to help each other out. And really, that's just opportunities. All these interactions, all these meetings, all these sales calls are simply ways to build relationships and increase the comfort level of sales staffs to know I'm on their side and want them to be successful. It's a way to encourage business owners and business managers that, that uh, I or whoever, you know, the manufacturer I'm working for, Mendota, is on their side, right? Wants them to make more money, wants yeah. them to be successful in this industry. So just a s small thing. Yeah. Okay. I want to ask you this. <laughs> we'll pause. I want to hear a funny story. You've been on the road for the better part of 20 years. Is that yeah, fair? A little more. A little yeah. more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what is the craziest thing you've ever seen on the road? There's too many things to count, right? The thing that comes to mind is as a young sales rep, I moved over to the Spokane market and I inherited Montana as a sales territory. And for me, Montana was the wild, wild west. 
first trip ever into Montana, never been there before. I get all the way out to the far reaches of my market and I'm a rep, I'm full of coffee. I gotta use the bathroom. <laughs> so I go introduce myself, you know, again, first impressions. Where's your bathroom? It's right down the hall. So I go in there and uh, I'm using the restroom and right in front of me is this mirror. So, you know, I'm, I'm checking myself out, you know, admiring how handsome I am. Yeah, of course. But behind me on the wall is this, is this beautiful lever action rifle. So, you know, I finish up, I wash my hands and like a knucklehead, I grab this rifle off of the wall and I throw the action just, to, just because it's a lever action and that's what you do. But unfortunately, there was a round. There was a, it was a 30-30 level, lever action rifle, and there was a round in the chamber. <laughs> so now I've got this loaded rifle in my hands, and as I put the bullet back into the chamber, of course, now the hammer is locked back, ready to kill a deer. <laughs> so for me to put this back on the wall, I can't just put it back hammer cocked, so I've got to put my thumb on the hammer, pull the trigger in the bathroom, hope that I've got my thumb on there properly so I'm not blowing a hole through this, uh, new, through this dealer's bathroom floor. And dealer, you know who you are if you're listening to this, to this podcast. But that's, that's probably the craziest thing I've run into. That is unbelievable. I, I live in Portland, Oregon. I've had some situations not quite like that. But you go into these situations and you're like, man, it's a big country and we're not in Portland anymore. <laughs> we're, we're not in Portland anymore. Yeah, that's great. No. Well, I want to I move on and, and get here. So I want to go through a day in the life. You're very effective at what you do. How do you structure your time on the road versus in the office? Well, yeah, you know, every, every company, every, every manufacturer has a different cadence and, and rhythm and season dictates that. But if I were just to th throw a number at you, I'd say, you know, I'm a day and a half in the office. I'm about three and a half days on the road making sales calls with customers. So that means that if I'm on the road in a hotel room, I'm doing office work at night or, or first thing in the morning before I head on out. So that's, that's what a week looks like anyway. How, how far ahead do you plan your trips? Uh, well, I, I plan my trips probably two months in advance if I've got big loops I want to do just to get it on the calendar and communicate with my family as far as when I'm going to be out. But as far as the actual prep and agenda, that's happening one, maybe two weeks in advance, frankly. And do you always give your dealers notice when you're coming to town? Boy, nine times out of 10, yeah. I, I'm, I'm creating an appointment. There, there are times when I will stop by because I had an appointment cancel or I got to a market faster than I expected. Oftentimes I'll call from the road when I'm just about out. So it's just not a surprise visit. But, you know, man, without an appointment, a dealer is just free to assume that we think our time is more valuable than theirs. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's that's just the worst impression that, that I, as a sales rep, can give my retailer, right? So, so yes, usually I've got an appointment. Do you ever secret shop your markets? You know, <laughs> I can't, frankly. You know, I guess I could, I could have <laughs> other people secret shop. But, and, and I've heard your podcast. You're a big, a big advocate of that. Oh, yeah. And you can't secret shop anymore either. <laughs> uh, you're, you're kind of a noticeable fella. But, but the beauty of, of working for a distributor is I've, I've made sales calls on all these retailers. Sure. So even if they're not Mendota retailers today, Day, I've made sales calls on these folks. I've, I have relationships with just about everybody in the Pacific Northwest. So Yeah. I, I think secret shopping is so valuable. It's funny you say that. I, a couple weeks ago, Grant and I were on a blitz trip in just a little bit past the Midwest. And my thing is anytime I'm in a new market, I always go secret shop. I mean, I, I just, I love it. it. It teaches me so much about what people are doing, what's working, what's not. And we, we went into this business and there was this really nice lady and she looks at me and I had a mask on, you know, it's COVID and everything. And she's like, have we met before? And I'm like, I don't think we have. And she's like, man, you look familiar. And I said, no, I, I get that a lot. And we go through the secret shopping and everything and, and we leave and Grant's like, Tim, she was trying to figure out who you were the whole time. And I'm like, no way. And sure enough, I, we got back and a couple hours later, I had an email in my inbox from her and she said, hey, Tim, good she to see you. She figured it she out. Did. And, I, and I wrote her and just said, hey, we're secret shopping this market. It was, thanks for showing us around. <laughs> what are you going to do? Yeah, that, yeah. that is great. But I, I think you know, for any reps listening that, that aren't as famous as art, Man, secret shopping your market is so powerful. Like to be able to go to a dealer and say, hey, you know, this is what the rest of your market is doing. This is what works. This is what doesn't. And even if it's your first impression with a dealer, secret shopping your dealer is really good too. I want to move on though. I'm getting distracted on this. You're talking about office days versus days on the road. And I want to go to office days first. What are you trying to accomplish during an office day? Oh my goodness. 
we are entering the boring part of this interview, Tim. Uh, no, this is um, office day. You know, my office day probably looks a lot like office days for our retailers. When our retailers have time in front of their in front of their desk, I'm following up on on previous commitments. On uh, proposals, I'm talking with my boss at Mendota on what we can do for retailers, what we can do for uh, displays. Like I mentioned, I'm creating appointments yep. so that I've got an agenda and I know what I'm I know what I'm planning for in the following week. But really, also I'm preparing. Right, I'm thinking through. Gosh, I haven't been to Montana for a while. Next week I'm in Montana. I better make sure my truck is outfitted, right? I've got everything I need in that truck, and I've got everything I need mentally for the training I'm doing, for the positioning I'm talking about, if I've got any service calls, uh, you know, just my marketing lit. So a lot of a lot of preparation and appointment and communication with retailers. Yeah. Um, I just want to ask you practically, I mean, because I swear, like, I'll call you at like eight o'clock on a Sunday and you pick up the phone. I mean, I'm not giving anyone permission if Art is your rep. I'm not giving him permission <laughs> to call you at eight o'clock on a Sunday, but you, but you, but you have and you do. Do you have like a, 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 a rule that you keep of like, I always return voicemails by this time, or I always return emails by this time? It, it's just as, as soon as possible. Okay. So I, I don't have a, a by this time, but uh, for, for the dealers that, that know me and call me, if I can't get to the phone, you know, ha- half time, most of my retailers don't leave me voicemails anymore. Because if I see I missed a call from, from that phone number, I'm just calling them back sure. once I get out of my, my present appointment. You know, I- anytime the phone rings, it's, it's just an opportunity. Yeah. And I think, that, I think that as reps on the road, it's easy to hide behind that obscurity of yeah. being on the road, right? It's mysterious. They must be doing something important when we're actually just driving down the street. Yeah. So, you know, it doesn't have to be Tim Reed popping them on my phone. But if a, if a retailer calls me, my gosh, what an opportunity, right, for me and for Mendota to, to train, to encourage, to help make their job easier. And, and I just get excited because I know they're selling my stuff. I, yeah, I love it. I mean, that, that's the thing. When, when you're visiting a dealer, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? Boy, I think it goes back to the appointment and, and every visit. Just like if you're on the retail floor, every person that walks through those front doors has a different need, a, a different thing that they're coming into your floor with. And I would say every visit that I have has a different goal or agenda. Maybe I'm training a new salesperson or new products or having tips of what's been effective for other retailers. But again, I want every dealer to feel like it was worth their investment to allow me their time. The the business owner's most valuable resource that they've got is their employee's time. So I, I better deliver on what they need or what they expect. Otherwise, I violated that trust, right? Yeah. Do you think that it's more important if you, I'm going to put you in a tough spot here. Is it more important to communicate with the owner or with the sales team? Absolutely. The sales team. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm so glad you said that without hesitation. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I always get nervous if I am stuck in a meeting with the owner and then I've got to get out of there for, for my next appointment. Yeah. I, I really worry that the sales team don't think I value them. Yeah. I, I would say, you know, I worked with a guy, Mark Warren, years ago, uh, a legend in the Oregon market. Oh, yeah. And Mark Warren was the best guy out there for not walking in the front door, walking in the back door, walking through the warehouse. Uh, he knew every warehouseman's name, yeah. every installer's name, the receptionist. He had relationships with everybody. Yeah. And so, you know, Mark hasn't hasn't worked for AES for whatever it's been, 10 years now, and his name still comes up. He's still legendary because, you know, Zig Ziglar, he's famous for a lot of sayings. And one of his sayings was, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And and Mark Warren embodied that. Yeah, that's so good. I I love that you talked about the sales team. I, I, I believe that the most effective reps know that the sales team is a gold mine. They know that. I mean, I've told this story in the podcast before, but you know, the, the reps that were so formational in my growth were like Kip Rumens, Ed Hozak, Deb Hannig, Troy Olson. These were people that invested deeply in me. And I just remember working at, a, at, at different companies, they would come in and they might spend 15 minutes with my boss in, in their office, but they'd spend two hours on the sales floor. And it was like intense training. And, and that's the investment that pays off because I think that there's a lot of times where reps, and I don't, I don't know this behind the scenes, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to make a comment on it, but I, I think that reps are judged on a lot of the wrong things. You know, did you get this meeting with the owner? How many displays do we have? And I'm, 
I'm not saying that, that displays don't matter, but they don't matter as much as you think. Like I would rather have a dealer that has one display and an effective sales team than a dealer where I've won seven displays and the sales team could care less about my products. And I think that you do a really good job of coaching the sales team. And I actually want you to tell a story. So Grant Falco talks like all the time, whenever we're, we're out somewhere and we're doing sales training and coaching, he always talks about ICC chimney. You, you know, you, Art Ratcliffe taught me how to sell ICC chimney 15 years ago and it changed the way I think about sales. And, and, you know, I normally don't highlight specific brands, but this is, it was ICC chimney. Can you talk about why did you make that investment in teaching dealers to sell ICC chimney and, and what did that look like? Well, I, th- I think that speaks to the legacy of Tom Pugh and, and Bill Lentz and, and uh, Deb Hannig, right? I mean, who would think that selling I know. stovepipe would be fun or exciting? I mean, that's just sounds ridiculous. But, but that's really, um, I think what Grant is hitting on is, is the magic of our industry. And it's the magic of, of wherever you find yourself sitting, whatever retailer you work for, you, you've got something cool in your bag to sell, right? And that's what I've had fun doing is if we can find the differentiators in our product line, I, I, the, the thing that we do different that actually provides value to the end user, that's gold, right? I think ICC did that with Chimney. Town and Country did that with Clean Face yeah. and, and Low Heat. I think Mendota does it with Design and Logs. Big Green Egg did it with Kamado Cooking, right? There's, yeah. But our retailers all have all have unique things that they do. You know, their solutions or services that they do, their warranty that they offer that's different than their competitors, right? If we can find those little differentiators and stink and beat that drum yeah right that that's where the magic happens that's the fun thing you're hitting on something so important and it's that value doesn't exist unless you communicate it and i think that what what grant always talks about is is that back in the day you would say grant you gotta start selling chimney and grant would say what are you talking about i sell <laughs> chimney and he goes no you don't sell chimney you just tell a customer it's going to be 1200 bucks for a one-story chimney kit yeah, yeah. that's that's not like you gotta sell chimney and and you're talking about we just assume like oh, it's a chimney kit, or yeah, of course it's a Kamado grill, or yeah, of course they have this. But the customer doesn't know that. Well, if you've got something that's unique, right, and it may be something that's that's perceived as small, but if it's important to us and if we can communicate the value to the end user, my gosh, then then again, that's that's one more, well, back in the day when I was talking to Grant or, or Louie, that's one more reason to buy from Valco's, right? Sure. Because we've got this great chimney. Or that's one more reason to buy from my local retailer that happens to have Mendota because we've got this cool brand that we can make look like anything that, that your home needs. I think that if we as reps can point out those special things that in turn makes the retailer special, that just helps the, the the salespeople on the floor puff out their chest a little bit and have confidence, right? You hit the nail on the head. Confidence is the key. I mean, a sales rep, I mean, both a manufacturer, distributor sales rep, but especially one on the retail floor, they have to be confident. If they're not confident, like you're done. Ab- absolutely. Absolutely. You, you've, you've got a new guy on the floor here at Fireside who didn't know the first thing about yeah. hearth industry. And so you, you guys brought him up slowly, but... It didn't take long for him to just realize, hey, you know what? I can I can do this. Yeah. I've got support behind me, and this isn't so bad. This isn't so bad. And I'm going to jump in because it it was slow, but I'll say within six weeks he was fully on the floor making sales. And and we both know this guy. I mean, his numbers within just a couple months were crushing people that had been doing it for a lot longer. And what is so cool about that is basically we created lanes for him. And you know, if you if you have a new sales rep starting in your company, we'll only allow them to sell gas inserts when there's gas line in the fireplace. That like literally in in, yeah. in three weeks, you can train them on that, and that's all they need. Like if in in September, they can be they can be busier than just about anyone else and actually selling more products because they're not getting bogged down with like twenty feet of chimney and what do we do if we have to bury this gas line in the yard and, and run it? No. All, all this person's allowed to sell is gas inserts when a gas line is in place. I'm telling you, you will crush it and then slowly open up lanes as they get more competency. 
Well, and, and that's uh, just just the way you created lanes to to get your salesperson confident uh, on the floor. You know that that's exactly what a sales rep's job is: is yeah. just to build build their comfort level, build the uh, the realization that hey, I can I can sell this, and if I have questions, there's plenty of support behind me that that we can get it done. We'll get back to our conversation with Art Ratcliffe in just one minute. Hey, if you're in the middle of the busy season right now, listening, you're probably feeling stressed, right? Team members are busy, the phone is ringing, and it's super hard to get back to everything that you need to. It's easy to feel like this is the way that it is, and your business will never get over that hump. If that's the way that you feel, you need to think about taking advantage of a blitz trip. So during a blitz trip, Grant Falco and I come into your business, and we spend two and a half days there. The first night, we're going to spend the evening with you building out your company's organizational chart and really taking a deep look at what the functions are of everybody within the company. And this is going to help identify huge pain points, and we can help show you how the pieces in your company can work together better and more efficiently. The next day, we're going to dive deep with your key team members to review everything about the systems and processes that your business has or doesn't have. Grant's going to focus on the warehouse and the installation process where I'm going to key in on the showroom and the sales process. But by the end of the day, we're going to have identified a lot of the key opportunities that you have to take things to the next level. Now, the last day, we're going to start with an early morning breakfast meeting to really talk frankly about your role as an owner and what we've seen in the company so far. But after that, we're going to boil things into a big three that in the next six months, these are the three key areas that you need to go to work on. And we're going to be talking with your team about those before we leave. Now, after we've left, we're going to follow up with a formal analysis of your business and a roadmap of what you need to be doing over the next six months to get over this hump. One of the best compliments I've received is from someone who we recently did a blitz trip with, and he got in touch with me and he said, Tim, you would not believe the sales that our team members have made. The secret sauce has worked. When can we get another one booked? So, you know, we ultimately want you guys to win, and that's what these trips are about. I will preface this and say they are expensive. Expensive and they're not for everybody. But if this is something that you think is right for your business to take you to the next level, you can go to itsfiretime.com slash blitz and schedule your trip today. That's itsfiretime.com slash blitz. One thing that you mentioned in the, the story about chimney, you know, differentiators, I think that's so important. And one thing I'll say when I'm talking with companies and, and team members about making sales. I think that we in the industry jump too fast to these micro details that that really don't matter to the consumer. We have to start much more big picture and slowly work our way in. Very often when me and Grant go into businesses, and I'm not going to give away Grant's secret here because he's not on the podcast to do it, but when me and Grant go into these businesses and do teaching and coaching and we talk about, you know, gas inserts or gas fireplaces, there's a feature that I'm going to say 70 plus percent of the industry has on their gas inserts and gas fireplaces and no one talks about it. And so me and Grant go in, we go, guys, ignore everything. Talk about this one feature and you will sell more fireplaces. And everyone's like, but everybody has that. And we go, yeah, but no one talks about it. And, and I love that you're hitting on the idea that like, yeah, you have to differentiate. And even if your products do some of the same things as other people's, no one's talking about it. So if, if and this is where clarity comes into play. If 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 you speak in simple terms with clarity, you'll you'll be like a magnet drawing customers to you. And it doesn't matter if your competition technically sells the same thing or maybe their price is a little bit lower. If if you offer clarity, they will choose you. There's no question. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think that you you have you've really helped me as far as clarity and as far as my messaging, Tim. You know, I, I I tell people the story. Th- three months ago, I'm I'm courting Fireside, and I'm and I'm talking to you about possibly bringing on Mendota. And so you say, "Fine, Art, give me give me your pitch. Let's go out to lunch and let's talk it through." <laughs> and so we're at lunch, and I'm telling you all my features and benefits and why you know Mendota is the best thing since sliced bread, and and I'm going to be great for your for your sales guys. And you said, "No, no, no, Art, t- tell me h- how." How are you going to help my salespeople sell Mendota? So I'm thinking, geez, 
he, he must not have been listening to me. <laughs> so I'm going now over my features and benefits again with you because obviously you weren't listening and you had to stop me and say, no, Art, <laughs> how are you going to help my salespeople be successful? Let's almost take Mendota out of it, right? How are you going to help my salespeople be successful? And I, you know, I tell you, here I am, the grizzled industry veteran, and I'm supposed to know this stuff. And that really rocked me back, frankly. I, I was not prepared for that question. And so, you know, I really give you credit, and I think that uh, what you're teaching the industry is so valuable. You you help clarify my thinking about how to understand first, right? What what the what the dealers needs are, or train them how to understand what the clients needs are and then tailor our solutions just to those needs rather than the litany of features and benefits, right, that, that, that so many of us think is so important about our, about our black box or about our chimney or about a, whatever it is. Yeah, that's so good. I'm, I'm flattered that you tell that story. That means a lot. You just stumbled upon something that I want to I wanna talk about for just a quick second here. But you you talked about the idea that, you know, we get so wrapped up in our features and benefits and, you know, that kind of the inside joke of this podcast is like, no one cares about BTUs, no one cares about your whatever two stage burner or all these things, but they they care about things that are actually going to make their lives better. And it's not that those features don't matter, they do, but it's only if they're framed in a way that makes the person think, oh, this could make my life better. That's what matters. And I want to talk about this. We we think about if I if I have one message for the industry, it's this: is that we think about fireplaces from the inside out. Consumers think about them from the outside in. So we and I'm putting myself in here too. Like I'm, I'm you know I, I I fight the curse of knowledge just like everybody else in the fireplace industry does. We get so worried about like, oh man this burner has this type of turndown rate or this is a steel burner versus a ceramic burner and man like this gas valve does this and we'll look at the look at the details in these you know high definition logs and this has birch and this has driftwood that's where we go i'm not saying that stuff doesn't matter but i'm saying that customers are not on that wavelength customers think outside in and we have to understand this. If you're, if you're listening to this as a manufacturer and you're developing products and marketing literature, you have to start thinking outside in, not inside out. And there's a story, the first and only time I've met your wonderful wife, Molly, she came into one of our stores. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tee this up. You'll have to correct me if I tell the story wrong. But, but she came into one of our stores and I was like, oh, it's so good to meet you, Molly. I think it was my day off and I just happened to be in there. And I said, Molly, can you do me a huge favor? And we walked over to a wall of fireplaces. I said, Molly, okay, which one of these is your favorite? And I'm going to tell you, the one that she pointed towards is not the one that anyone with fireplace industry experience would have pointed to. And we asked her why. And I'm not even going to give her answer. But her answer was something that was so simple and so obvious because she was looking outside in. Why would I care about the logs when the screen is ugly? Why would I care about the brick interior when I don't like the decorative front on the outside? And, and, and to me, that was so foundational. And she was just the perfect example of thinking outside in. Well, and I think, you know, we talked a little bit about displays, but that does underscore the importance of great displays. You know, our, our dealerships need to have great displays. Yeah. I, you know, my wife and I right now, right now are shopping for a fireplace. And every I, time I, I show her a fireplace. We'll, we'll talk after this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. But, you know, every time I show her a fireplace, I'm looking at this box in the middle of, uh, in the middle of this wall. She's not even looking at the box. She's looking at this beautiful wall. And I treat, keep trying to point her towards this box in the middle and she keeps wanting to look at the big picture. So, you know, I, I 100% agree with you. I think that we, we do have to have good-looking displays. But, you know, I think that's part of the beauty of what I get to sell today with Mendota products is that, well, and you've taught me this, slow the sales process down and, and, and understand the whole vibe of your client's home, right? If we can find out what flooring they have, what color scheme they have. Tell me about your furniture. Tell me about the stone that we're going to put around this fireplace. If if we can, as sales people on the floor, close our eyes and get this Google 360 degree view of their room, of their view, of their kitchen that's next to their room, you know, 
with a twinkle in our eye, we can say, you know what? I think I've got just the fireplace for you. And that's, that's the magic of, of really putting yourself and, and doing the outside in conversation, right? We're, we're not just selling. We're not selling a fireplace. We're selling a lifestyle. We're selling family time. We're, we're selling Christmas pictures, prom pictures. And we want to make sure that that fireplace just fits in with everything that they think is more important than <laughs> than the fireplace, right? Yeah. Oh, man, that's so good, Art. I, I love that you're going that direction because one of my favorite things to do when I'm working on a showroom floor is 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 I get a blank piece of paper and the customer comes in and we're, we, we, we greet them. We sit down at the desk and we're going through some questions to make sure I understand what they have. And I'll take this blank piece of paper and I'll be like, okay, awesome. Like, thanks so much for coming in. I, I really appreciate you, you you telling me all this. So if I'm understanding what you're saying, You've got this, right? And I literally just draw like a straight line, like a floor. And then I'll go, and, and your ceiling's kind of like right here. And like, I'll draw like another straight line across the top of the paper. And I'll go, and, and, your, and your fireplace is, is raised up a little bit like this. And I'll draw a square, like an inch above my floor. And I'll say, and what you want is, you want a mantle going across the top. And so I draw another box for a mantle. And guys, like, I can't draw. And I'll be like, and, and, and you'd like some stone on the sides. So I'll draw, like, a line down the side, a line down the side, and just, like, scribble it in with, with my pen. And I'll say, is, is this kind of what you're thinking? And the customers lean in and they go, yes. Because it's not about how good I can draw. It's about the fact that I have unlocked something in their minds where their vision has been captured. They can see it. Yes, this goes to Bill Lentz selling in the ultimate showroom. Their mind is the ultimate showroom. And again, like we haven't talked about a fireplace. We haven't talked about BTUs. We've talked outside in. And now we have a connection to where, just like you said, with a twinkle in your eye, I can say, hey, this is perfect. I think I've got the fireplace for you. Let's go take a look at it. Uh, absolutely. And and you may not have that perfect fireplace on your floor, but you got something close. And you go to the web and you show them what what you think they described to fit their color scheme, to get, hit their vibe, to hit their their media, you know, whether they want modern or, or traditional. So yeah, that, that's absolutely the beauty. But, but we have got to capture their vision of Christmas, right? Of their warmth, of, of the whole room. Because like it or not, that black box in the middle of that picture is, is one of the lower things on their priority list. So if we can tie it into everything that really is important to them, Man, we've won. Yeah, that's so good. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a hard question on you here. You get to answer this in one sentence, okay? Huh. You ready? I'm ready. What's the most important thing a sales rep can do for their dealers? <laughs> I got one sentence, huh? Yep. We we've hit we've hit on so many of those things before, but my sentence would be two words, be responsive. There's so many things that we can do in our relationship with our dealers, but being available, being responsive, is the is the best thing we can do because how how often are we as sales reps in front of our dealers right if it's a more remote market we may be in front of them once a quarter so i see you four times a year is that really the only impact that i have i i better be available to you for for the other 360 days a year that that i'm not in front of you so I, I think that's that's really that's really it. I mean, we've talked about respecting their time and their employees, and we've talked about, you know, we've beat the value yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, drum to death. But I think if we can be responsive and be available, uh, that, that's all we can do. That's really good. Okay, I'm going to turn this question now. We, we've talked a lot about you know the value that you can give retailers, but I want to flip it back to manufacturers. And this isn't a one sentence answer. What's the most important thing a sales rep can do for the company that they work for? Uh, well, boy, I think that whether we're in a sales, well, we're, we're, this context is about a sales rep, but I would broaden it to say any of us who are employees have different roles in our company, right? And so, you know, my role is sales. And so I cannot lose sight that fundamentally, I've got to deliver sales for, for my company, right? All the flowery language or big thoughts, the, the, those, those aren't going to matter or have much credence with my company that I work for unless I'm delivering the goods, right? And I would say as a salesperson on the floor of a retailer, we've got an extra burden. We're, we've got an obligation not just to create revenue to cover our own expenses, our own salaries or commissions, but we're responsible for that warehouse guy. We're responsible for the office employee, the admin staff. We've got to generate revenue for the company so we all can be healthy, right? So that's 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 a that's a burden. But you know, I would say, you know, once we've got our core 
directive dialed in, when we're providing that value to the company, we've got an opportunity to poke our head out of the foxhole and see how we can help other people. And so Rick Lucas, who who, uh, I used to work with at AES, he's probably the best example I can give of that. That guy is always looking to make other people's lives better. I still call him today and he gets my head screwed on straight and I'm his competitor now. But, you know, if we can help our boss be more effective at their job, if we can help our coworkers with whether it's an attitude or whether it's their sales process, you know, this is a, this is a small industry. We work in small, relatively small companies. If there's something that we personally can do to, to just rise the tide, I think that's, that's, the, that's a great value that we can offer to, the, to our employer. That's really good. As you were talking, there's two things that came to mind for me, and I want to see what you think of this. Yeah, I mean, no question, a rep's got to be able to deliver the goods. One thing that I'm thinking about is I think that a couple pieces of value that reps can bring to the table for the companies they work for is, number one, market intel. That, that they, are the, they are the eyes and ears of the company Absolutely. to truly understand what's going on in a market. And I think number two is that I believe that sales reps can help manufacturers and distributors understand their customers' problems. And I'm, I'm just going to go on the record and say it, that generally speaking, manufacturers and distributors do not understand the problems of their dealers. And it's not because they're stupid or anything like that, but it's because many of them are completely disconnected and in a lot of companies, they don't listen to their reps. But the truth is that that you could, I mean, I, we could go through your accounts and I could say, what's, what's the problem that this dealer is having right now? And you, I mean, without thinking, I know you could say, oh, they're having this problem, this problem, this problem. And I mean, as a manufacturer, you've got so much intel between your sales reps. I mean, you got to think that if you're trying to sell to dealers, you can't sell to them like they're consumers because they have a whole different set of problems than consumers do. And for the companies that do listen to their reps and make changes and I'm not saying in the way that they market to end users, in the way that they market to dealers, I think that there's power there and sales reps are the key to harnessing it. Uh, uh, well, agreed, agreed. And I think that the, the, the reps, we can be a window into the market, absolutely, uh, for our manufacturers. But we as reps also, you know, the, the, the dealers are hungry for the same thing, right? The, the, the dealers are uh, potentially trapped inside their own showroom. And so as reps, we've got an opportunity to be this positive window into their potential future, right? They, they want to see or hear what's selling, right? Yes. What, what, what market trends are out there? What displays are working? How is someone else positioning products to, to win? And so um, just like we really have an obligation and an opportunity to help our employer see the dealer, I think that as reps, we also can help the retailers see other retailers and best practices and, yeah. and encourage them. Yeah. That's so good. Art, when it's all said and done, what do you want to be known for? The, 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 the legacy question. I think that, uh, gosh, if I can give dealerships or other salespeople or, or the company I work for encouragement, and I'd say not just to sell my box that I'm selling today, which I think is really cool, yeah. but it's but it's bigger than that. If if I can leave uh, the dealership with with concepts that will help them sell everything, right? If if I can give them concepts that will help them sell more Travis, more Napoleon, right? More Blaze King, barbecues, stovepipe, whatever it is, then then that's that would be my win, really. Yeah, I love that because because you are going to win as your dealer rises. There's no question, and I think that's a terrific answer. As I think about this, Mendota is really fortunate to have. I think about you. I think about what Nathan's doing out of the Midwest. I mean, they're fortunate. They're fortunate to have reps like you guys that are investing deeply in this. And I think that, as just with this conversation today, I think there's gonna be a lot of value that reps are gonna get. Just thinking about how do I build relationships, how do I give value, and I think retailers are gonna get a lot too. And I think I think that they're gonna think, man. I, I wish I had reps like Art and like Deb and like Ed and these, these people that we've talked about. I think, I think this is a really special conversation. So thanks for being here. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with Art Ratcliffe. I mean, I'm telling you, Art is a personal friend of mine and he is excellent at what he does. And it's worth listening to both as a dealer who's trying to figure out how can I get more value out of my sales reps? How can I start to pay more attention to what they have to say regarding market trends and sales tactics? But also, if you're a fellow sales rep or if you're a manufacturer, you know, your reps 
have an understanding of the market that I guarantee your marketing team doesn't. And it's worth talking to them. And as you start to collect data from different reps in different markets, you can put together a holistic picture of how things are that's really critical. And it sounds simple, but many companies just don't do it. One of the big takeaways that I want you to be thinking about after this conversation is that sales really is service. I mean, when you listen to Art talk, he looks at this as a service. I mean, he views himself as a steward that like he's been given these gifts by God and his job is to go out and steward that resource to give value to his customers. And that's a big deal. You'll notice that when I asked him about who's the most important person to talk to in a company without hesitation, it's the sales team. No question. And if you play your cards right as a rep, you can get a sales team on your side and get them biased for your products because of the way that you treat them. They can be an army for growing your sales and making your company a heck of a lot more money. So I, I love that he went there because I'm, I'm, I agree. I mean, you need to be spending your time with the people who are on the sales floor. And with that, I just want to throw out some best practices from someone who's been a retailer and has, has worked with a lot of sales reps. Man, if you're a rep, think about going the extra mile and putting together like price templates, even if these are just simple Excel spreadsheets, if you can make these custom for each of your accounts and make it easier for them to price your products than anybody else's, man, you need to do it. And, and, I don't care if your manufacturer or your your distributor hasn't come up with these themselves. You as the rep, bring that to the table and that's going to be a huge value wedge for people to do business with you. You know, next up, what would it look like to spend time with the team members and salespeople of your dealers to actually put together sales goals for them? I mean, I would say most owners wouldn't be offended if you said, hey, let's make it a goal to sell five units this month or 10 units this month, whatever it looks like. And you could actually start to track that. And man, maybe you have like a merit badge system where you'll get them a jacket for your company if they cross this threshold. These are things that that are really important and and it's going the extra mile to give value and, and to create incentive for these dealers to want to do business with you. Lastly, I think the most important thing you can do as a rep is to provide coaching and practice. Now, some reps do this And many don't, but for the reps that are thinking about it, if you go to one of your retailers and say, hey, can I get two hours with your sales team uninterrupted to work on live sales practice, I guarantee that no one's going to say no. I mean, if they do, they're crazy because they're throwing dollar bills away. But if you can invest in live sales practice and coaching with team members, it will absolutely change the way that they view themselves as a salesperson and that they view you as a rep. And they're going to see a transformation in productivity and effectiveness that is all because of you and that will bias them towards your products. I mean, for me personally, like there's companies, I've talked about this with like Travis Industries and I haven't sold Travis for eight years, but that blood still runs deep in me because the investment that was made early on with the Travis sales reps. And this is true with many companies that I still am passionate about because of the investment that was made. So with that said, I hope you got a ton out of this conversation because there's a lot there that you can pick up on. Now, if this podcast has been a blessing for you and you want to support it financially, you can do that by going to the website patreon.com slash it's fire time. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash it's fire time. Now you can contribute whatever amount you want, but I'll just tell you that we are so thankful for the contributions that we have and it's allowing us to start outsourcing some of the administrative duties of this podcast so that we can keep the production level as high as possible and focus on giving you the best content ever. So with all that said, I hope you guys have an amazing rest of the week. I want you to take away one thing from this episode and apply it. Maybe it's the idea of sales as service. Maybe it's the idea of live sales practice or of making a phone call to your rep and trying to figure out how you can use them as a consultant to understand your marketplace. But whatever it is, I want you to pick one thing and go out and do it. Now, as always, I can't tell you just what a pleasure it is for me to host this. I mean, I don't take it lightly that... I get to be a part of growing this industry and helping you further your business. So I can't wait to talk to you guys again next week. I'll get out of the way and we'll see you again soon. Thank you for listening to the Firetime Podcast. To learn more, visit the website itsfiretime.com. Music from this episode was written and recorded by In Bloom out of Portland, Oregon. We thank you for listening to the Firetime Podcast, where it's never hot enough, slow is fast, 
and the way to win is to make it so stupidly easy to buy from you that there's no excuse not to. We'll see you next time.